Great, thanks, Jed. <clears throat> um, so I have I have three project updates to give. Not all of them were funded by the Raw Products Committee, but I think they're all of some interest. So I'll talk about all of them. Um, first of all, our processing P variety, yep, processing P variety trial. Uh, this is the same study we do every year. It's subsidized by the Raw Products Committee. And uh, the, the seed companies send us the seed that they would like us to trial. And they tell us if they would like us to plant it in our April 20th target date or May 10th. And it's just to provide um, common environment data for the varieties that they're interested in. Um, <clears throat> and so generally every year we plant about 60 varieties across the two planting dates. And I will, whenever I talk about this, I will always thank the Raw Products Committee for helping to fund our new viner that we bought a couple years ago. It really helps to increase the efficiency of this project. Um, and one of the goals of this project is to also provide access to the plots for the, the breeding companies, the processors to come look at the peas. And this year, university policy dictated that that could not happen. And that was a, that was a pretty major bummer. Um, only people who work at the university were allowed to go to those plots. And so um, we couldn't have our annual meeting this year. We couldn't go look at the plots. So what I did instead is I took photos of every plot. And with the help of a colleague, we put them all into some um, big PDF files. And I'll give you the link to where these are all found. But for example, um, every variety had, was uh, planted in three replicates. And so I took a plot uh, or a photo of each plot from the three replicates. I took a photo of a representative plant from those plots and they're all compiled together by planting date and by seed company. Um, so these photos and all of the tabular data, I'm not gonna show tables and tables of, of the data from this project because that's rather boring and I have other projects to talk about today, but all the tables, all the charts that show the results, all the photos of this are available um, on this website, z.umn.edu slash peas. Um, most of the participants in the project have a copy of the report that's been emailed to them so far. The pictures are now available, they're up online. Um, and for next year, the, the forecast for being able to visit the plots for next year seem slightly improved. The latest that I've heard from the university is that uh, it's probable that individuals or very small groups will be able to come on site and visit plots. Uh, they will not be allowed in, a, in our buildings and they will have to wear masks and they will have to ask permission to be here on specific days. We need to know exactly who is coming on site and when. Um, but that is currently where the visiting the plots things thing stands for next summer. So um, some improvement, hopefully, and we'll know more as the as the season gets much closer. Um, so the next project I want to talk about was parts of it were initiated by the products committee, and we were able to use some of that funding to leverage uh, other grant money from AFREC, our fertilizer checkoff program. And this project was mostly done by Carl Rosen, but all of the, the field treatments, all the planting and harvest and everything was done by us in Wasika. And the reason this came about is in some earlier research, uh, Carl had measured, um, so this is a sweet corn field that's just been harvested. And Carl had measured about 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre left in that residue. And so the question is, if, if a, a, a farmer who's contracting a uh, sweet corn field, harvest their sweet corn, and it looks like this, they will probably plant field corn next year. So the question is, how much of this 60 pounds or whatever is available to next year's field corn crop? So it's kind of a field corn experiment in a sweet corn rotation system. And it's, it's kind of confusing to talk about, so I, I have to describe what we did. Um, the current standard recommendations are if you're growing field corn and the previous year soybeans were grown, you can subtract about 40 pounds of nitrogen from the field corn nitrogen recommendation. 
And current recommendations are also, if you're growing field corn and sweet corn was the previous crop, you don't subtract anything, which is kind of, now that we know there's about 60 pounds of nitrogen left in that sweet corn residue, that seems like maybe we should have a credit for the subsequent field corn crop. So that's why we did the research. So what we did is, it's a three-year study. So in 2016, 2017, and 2018, in three separate fields, we grew field corn, standard production practices. The following year, on this, on this field, we grew either field corn, or soybeans, or sweet corn, or sweet corn followed by winter rye. So once the sweet corn was harvested, we planted winter rye. So that was done 2017, 2018, and 2019 in four replicates. One, two, three, four. Standard production practices for the soybeans, for the sweet corn, and for the field corn. And then in the following year, 2018, 2019, and 20, we had six nitrogen rates and we planted field corn. The whole field got field corn and we had six nitrogen rates. So this plot here had six nitrogen rates, but the previous year it was field corn. This plot had six nitrogen rates, the same six rates, but the previous year it was soybeans. And this, these two plots had six nitrogen rates. The previous year they were both sweet corn and this plot happened to have winter rye after the, the sweet corn. And so what that kind of looked like, here's a picture from the fall of one of the year zeros. So this is sweet corn that was harvested. And then shortly after harvest, we drilled rye, cereal rye. You can see the field corn is still standing and the soybeans haven't been harvested yet, but the sweet corn is gone. Because you, sweet corn is harvested in July and August, there's a lot of time for that residue to break down, to mineralize, for the nitrogen to get into the soil. And so one of our questions was, do we need rye to help hold on to the nitrogen that is mineralized in the fall and early in the spring? And so this is a picture of the rye in the fall. And here's the following spring, what that rye looks like. Again, hoping that maybe the rye can hold on to some of the nitrogen provide it to the field corn crop that will be grown on this entire field this year, in, in this case in 2019. So the rye was terminated and then the fertilizer treatments were applied and field corn was planted to the entire field. So exa for example, in this area here, the whole thing um, was sweet corn followed by winter rye in 2018. And then in 2019, there were six nitrogen rates applied and just behind it, it was field corn in 2018, and then six nitrogen rates applied and field corn planted in 2019. And that's what this whole field is. It's those 16 plots of a previous crop, and each one of the 16 plots is split up into six subplots of nitrogen rates, and then the whole thing is planted in field corn. Again, it's kind of confusing to talk about, but um, hopefully we're getting there. So what we measure is field corn yield. Field corn yield in that the year one of the study, basically the, the third year that we've been doing stuff in that field, what was the yield of the field corn? And the, we we're measuring relative yield here, yield compared to the maximum possible yield in that year um, of field corn. If the previous crop was field corn, this blue line, or soybeans, the orange line, or sweet corn or sweet corn with rye, the purple and gray lines here. At the six different nitrogen rates for field corn, 0, 50, 100, 150, 200, and 250 pounds of nitrogen. And what the arrows, these arrows indicate is the um, economically optimum nitrogen rate. And that's Carl and his crew, um, they use standard, um, statistical procedures to calculate based on the cost of the corn, the cost of the fertilizer, what's the most optimum rate of nitrogen to apply. And so for example, overall for all three years, 
the economically optimum nitrogen rate for field corn following field corn was about 216 pounds of nitrogen. And so what the study is actually looking for, what we're looking for is the difference between that and this. How much of a credit can we get for a different previous crop? Difference between this arrow and these arrows, the nitrogen rate differences is what we're looking for. So one thing to mention, there's been a lot of research done on, on field corn systems in our part of the country. Um, and so a lot is known about nitrogen rates for corn following corn and for corn following soybeans. And what we, what we would have expected is our corn on corn rates to look something like this. We would expect the peak to be a little bit higher than we saw. And we would expect the economic optimum to be a little bit lower nitrogen rate than we actually saw. But we got the data we got, so we have to go with that. So again, here's current recommendations for nitrogen fertilization of field corn. If the previous crop was soybean, you could subtract about 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre um, for the field corn crop. If the previous crop was sweet corn, subtract nothing, apply a full rate of fertilizer. But what we saw, the difference between those arrows in that previous chart, we saw a credit of about 50 pounds per acre from soybeans as a previous crop, and about 37 pounds per acre if sweet corn was the previous crop, whether or not there was rye grown. So the conclusions from this study is that a nitrogen credit for field corn can, can be given when sweet corn is the previous crop. And it didn't really matter if there was rye there or not, which that's new. Um, the credit may be slightly less than the soybean credit, um, but again, our, our corn on corn uh, results weren't exactly what we expected. So it, um, there's more work to be done, but um, this is interesting nonetheless. Other things that were studied on this experiment included um, where the nitrogen went, like how it was partitioned into the, into the field corn, um, for example, but also where the nitrogen was in the soil. And one thing that was discovered that I didn't show is that the rye cover crop does reduce soil nitrate levels in the spring. So the nitrates in the soil under these plots are lower than under any of the other plots, where there was field corn last year or sweet corn without rye or soybeans. There were lower nitrates in these plots, which is great for water quality. And um, you know, cover crops have all kinds of benefits for soil health too. But I will say, if you look at each year individually, in the third year, uh, the rye got pretty big. We got about 1.7 tons of biomass per acre in the third year. And uh, there was probably some immobilization and we didn't actually get a nitrogen credit. If you look at the third year individually. As a composite, the nitrogen credit was the same whether or not the rye was there. Um, so the rye just has to be terminated early enough. We terminated um, in early May, each of the three years, the first two weeks of May, and then planted the field corn, um, I think it was eight to 15 days after terminating rye in each of the years. There are lots of other questions to be answered, um, to be asked. Uh, the nitrogen fate stuff, not all of the analyses were done as of today, so I don't have all that data. Um, it's probably way different for irrigated sands. We have clay loam soils in Wasika, and um, that's useful. Uh, winter rye may not be the best choice. Um, there's, there's yield drag that field corn growers um, tend to account for when rye cover crops are used, when cereal rye cover crops are used. So there may be better options, um, but we didn't study any of those. And um, the third study, I, I'll take questions on all this stuff when I'm done. Um, the third study I wanted to talk about is sweet corn hail loss. And this was a project that uh, my boss Vince and I were doing here in Wasika. Joe Lauer at UW-Madison also did this. I don't have his data. Um, I'm just presenting what we found here in Wasika. And the reason we're doing this is because uh, 
when there is a sweet corn crop that is insured for hail loss and it hails, uh, the, law, the tables that are used to estimate how much yield was lost, those tables are based on field corn and they're old. And so um, the NCIS, National Crop Insurance Services, funded this study to help update some of those tables. And I don't actually have a logo for them, but they think it's funny when I use this logo. So I like it. And the way hail losses are calculated, it's, it's a two-step process, basically. The first step is to um, count how many plants are left in the field after hail, count how many plants were there before the hail, and determine the growth stage. And using those three those three sets of data, um, the adjuster will look in this table, and it's proprietary numbers, so I can't show you, but they will, um, there are numbers in here that will tell you how much yield was lost based on how many plants were lost. That's the first step. The second step, distinct step, different step. So they do the first step, work some math, then they do a second step. And the second step is distinct, and it's defoliation losses. Once they calculate how many plants are there, then second step, they estimate percent leaf area destroyed and the growth stage. And behind this green part are numbers that uh, where they estimate how much yield was lost due to defoliation. And those are two separate steps done sequentially. So what that means is we can do two separate experiments, one experiment on stand loss and one experiment on defoliation loss. And so for three years, we did a stand loss study. And I'll show the data from that. Um, there were, we had eight replicates per year. It was a single variety. We studied GSS 1477, um, single nitrogen rate, single planting date. Um, and so these results, we, we thinned the plants um, when they were really small, V3 to V5, when they were growing quickly at V8 to V10, or shortly before tasseling at V13 to V15. And when I say we thinned them, we had about 23,500 plants per acre. We thinned everything early on to the same population. And then we went out with a hoe and chopped off or dug up plants. We removed a fourth of the plants, or half of the plants, or three-fourths of the plants. And then we compared all of these data to the control where we didn't thin anything except that initial thinning to 23,500 or so. Um, and so this is composite over three years. Um, on average, we got 7.4 tons over the three years. But what we're interested in for numbers to put in those tables is yield loss. So everything is compared to that control. So this one, you know, lost 12% yield. So removing all that individual data points to get the averages, what we found is kind of interesting. Sweet corn is pretty resilient to stand loss. So for example, V8, plants are growing really quick. When we removed half of the plants, so we're down to a population of around 12,000 plants per acre, we only lost 12% yield. Um, some, some treatments didn't actually lose any yield, really. Um, so sweet corn is pretty resilient to stand loss. And if an adjuster were to come out to the field and calculate, based on their existing tables, how much yield loss there would have been, the numbers they get, shown here at the Xs, are pretty far off from what we actually saw. So for this, where we lost, you know, 12 or 14 percent or something, they would have estimated that we should have lost 50 percent. So um, the numbers in the table don't jive with what we saw. So that was a three-year study. We finished it in 2019. The next logical step is to do another three-year study, uh, which we started this year, and that's this defoliation study. And what we did, again, we had a single variety, single uh, planting date each year, single seeding rate. Uh, we had a lot more treatments this year. We defoliated to 25, 50, 75, or 100% defoliation. 
at five different growth stages. And um, so here's what at V5, here's what 100% defoliation looked like. We didn't do 50% at V5 because it's hard to remove 50%, but these plants, we removed all the leaves by hand and compared to the control, we didn't actually lose any yield. Again, the control is this black line, the average of the control. We didn't actually lose any yield when we did that kind of severe thinning. They were pretty resilient. As plants got bigger, um, a logical question is how do you thin to 25, 50, or 75% of um, leaf area? And um, what Joe from UW Madison recommended is that we use a machete. Previous research that they had done indicated that you can get really good um, if you if you estimate how much leaf area you're removing with a machete, it's actually very close to the actual leaf area removed. They had done measurements with that. So what we used is a Christmas tree shearing knife. It's a really flexible blade. It's very sharp and it's really easy to whip it around. So that's what we used to do thinnings as the plant as to do defoliation as the plants got older. And so at V8, is we removed 25, 50, 75, or 100% of the foliage. And the 100% treatments were all done by hand, removing all the leaves. I should also mention they were four row plots. Um, this only shows one row defoliated, but they were four row plots. And yield loss for all these was basically zero. We didn't lose any yield when we defoliated um, at any treatment amount at V8. So again, they're very resilient. At V13, shortly before tasseling, you can see 100% leaf removal treatment. Uh, there are tassels that were buried in there that we exposed by removing all the leaves. Um, and we removed a lot of the yield potential by removing all the leaves at V13. Uh, we removed a substantial amount of yield by uh, at 75% leaf removal. You can see we removed uh, 30 to 40% of the yield, but 25 or 50% leaf removal uh, did not uh, reduce yield at all. At tasseling, we got slightly lower yields at the 25 and 50% um, and extremely low yield at 100% defoliation. This is when the tassels are open, but not quite shedding pollen yet. Um, and we got a lot of yield reduction. Uh, this picture is shown at harvest, but we did a defoliation at the blister stage too, when the kernels look like little blisters. Um, and with 100% defoliation at harvest, you can still see some decent looking ears in there because the ears were starting to develop when we took all the leaves off. And we only lost 35 to 40% yield in these plots. So leaf removal at blister stage um, also didn't remove a lot of the yield potential, especially at the low, at the low uh, defoliation rates. So overall at, the, at V5, V8, 13, tassel and blister, here's what all the data look like. And again, the Xs are what an adjuster would have calculated based on what we did. And you can see the Xs don't, here it lines up with what we saw, but there are a lot of places where there's not a lot of overlap. And again, this is just one year of data, uh, a single hybrid, single planting date. Um, so for sweet corn, for our sweet corn hail loss studies in general, the current stand loss calculations overestimate yield loss, consistently overestimate the loss. Current defoliation uh, tabular values aren't super accurate either compared to what we actually saw in the field. Again, just for one year though. One hybrid, one planting date, and one initial population. And I will gladly take any questions um, about any of those experiments, anything we've done. Um, Thanks very much, uh, Charlie. Uh, so far, we don't have any tough questions for you. I think probably because people realize you've become quite an expert with a machete. Uh, so I think <laughs> they're afraid to ask you the tough questions. 
All kidding aside, uh, are there any entries in the chat box? We'll ask one more time uh, for Charlie. It's very interesting work and I appreciate uh, your presentation. Final call for any, whoop, here we have, whoop, we have two of them. Uh, did you see more double ears with the lower population? Great question. We, uh, yes, we looked at, well, just anecdotally, we looked at tillering and we, we didn't actually count ears from tillers, but there was increased tillering when we did more stand removal. Um, so yeah, that's a, you know, some of those treatments, they were 30, little over 30 feet long and we only had six plants that we thinned to in that 30 feet. Um, but some of them, if we thinned early, they were quite bushy. So yeah, it's leaf penetration down into the lower canopy, more tillering. Yes, that's where a lot of the, um, uh, that's where a lot of the um, extra yield came from, was sure. learning in second years. Right, and somewhat related to that, uh, Mark Myers asks, uh, in the stand loss and defoliation trials, were the yields uh, gross ear yields, or did you cut kernels and look at recovery? Uh, we cut kernels and look at recovery, too. And in the, in the stand loss study, the um, cut kernel losses mirrored the um, tonnage losses, too. And I haven't looked at the cut kernel losses in the defoliation studies yet, but. Interesting. So yeah. more, more information to come for sure. Yes. Great. Well, very interesting work. Thank you very much uh, for sharing it.